why are you guys getting this up and running? Um, I thought I would uh, give you a quick overview of this, the sort of um, whatever the algorithmic aspects of, uh, of Underworld and why it's designed the way it is. And uh, I, I guess uh, this is really more just so that the concepts that we're going to explore in the notebooks are a bit more obvious um, and, and that we're not, we're not sort of overwhelming you with terminology that we haven't sort of remembered and figured out and have to explain. Um, I'll try and be quick with this though, because in a sense it is a sort of a, a sideline. So. Um, so who's used Underworld before, actually? So a small number of people have actually used it. And uh, all right, so I'm quite happy. And who's used uh, sitcom? Okay. Let me just explain where all this stuff comes from. The, in a way, that this is a, this is an overview that I I presented at the uh, the CIG meeting, the BAMP meeting. 2014 as something of an overview of, of 20 years of modeling with the sitcom family of code, if you like. It was 20 years since sitcom first started working. Uh, and I thought it was worthwhile to sort of do, <coughs> do that summary at the time, just to show the sorts of problems that you know, we'd started working on um, and where they've got to. And I started with, uh, you know, in, the, in, in here is a sort of a, a model in which we tried to take Rob Vanderhill's tomography and map it into sitcom and get it all working, and it was just almost impossible to make that uh, to make that work at the time. And the code was working fine. The tomography model looked like a sort of a dish lock. It was all just sort of there's no slab in there. Um, and uh, <clears throat> anyway, so I guess that's, that's something that we kept working on, and, uh, and everything has improved since. But uh, but the progress of those models is from sort of simple fluid uh, fluid like behavior to ever ever more. Complex and that's something that I'll just touch on um, because that, that sort of is related to all of the different things that we've we've had to uh, we've had to do in order to make the code work. So um, I don't think you really need me to tell you that plate tectonics is multi-scale and multi-physics, um, but it does drive us quite substantially in in all of the codes, all of the geodynamics codes, sort of uh, focusing sort of on. Some aspects of this particular behavior, right? The the uh, I say multi-physics. That's in the sense of Ernest Rutherford, it's physics or stamp collecting, right? So um, it's, there's physics, chemistry, everything is, in, is implied here. But there's a, there's multiple systems interacting, and you know sometimes those scales are so crazily um, different that they look like different physics or chemistry altogether. The, uh, there's uh, we're always dealing with coupled phenomena, and um, this, the kinds of coupling that we envisage um, when we're sort of putting codes together, so that either some loose form of coupling in which you ask two codes to talk to one another, or some very tight form of coupling where you, know, you actually formulate the equations in a, in a, a, a coupled way. Um, and sometimes uh, somewhere in between where you start out by doing some sort of loose form of coupling and you find that that's not good enough. These sorts of things tend to drive the way that you, you build your algorithms. And uh, I would always argue that one of the things we're really keen to make sure is that uh, your, the availability of algorithms is not what drives the science. In other words, if there's something you want to do, then you should be able to have a go and do it, uh, rather than saying, I think I'll do something else because I can't find a, a code that does this or an algorithm that works for me. Okay, so that's always, the, that's always for me, is one of the important things about Developing new algorithms is you want to actually not choose your science problem uh, around the algorithms you have, but the other way around. Importantly, we are we are sort of always engaging in some somewhere between modeling and simulation. So modeling the idea of simplification, looking at how those processes work with one another, uh, looking at you know principal components of some system and trying to work out what you can ignore. And simulation is much more about reproducing what actually happened and predicting what might happen in a given scenario. Fidelity to the observations, simulating data, forecasting in some way, understanding uncertainty. And I think as a community, that's the way that we are starting to move. Whereas uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we were very much in the upper part of this, upper part of this, uh, this, this diagram. 
right? I'm going to skip all the ingredients and deal with a couple of the things which have driven, uh, which have driven um, the development of well, algorithmic development, <laughs> certainly of a bunch of codes. Um, and those two things are uh, quite turn out to be quite important and taking a long time to, <coughs> to get a handle on. This is a diagram from Dave Berkovici's paper in 1993, in which he identified uh, essentially a, a softening type of rheology. Um, this one here, in which you have uh, an increasing, initially increasing stress as a function of strain rate, but at some, at some yield point, essentially, it kicks over and starts weakening. And uh, uh, he showed with a bunch of mostly kinematically driven models that this would produce very sharp plate-like behavior and localization and so forth, which is sort of very familiar, but uh, nonetheless hasn't sort of been put on the radar of the mantle dynamics community um, very much before that. The difficulty with when you look at some rheology like this, of course, is that it's multi-valued for any given stress. There are two possible strain rates that, it, that um, satisfy that. And there's also a sort of forbidden region. This doesn't go off up to infinity. It has a, a peak, and there's no more. There's no, you can't go beyond that. Okay. So this sort of thing is also not an obvious uh, sort of staple of, of standard fluid dynamics methods and codes. So extreme nonlinearity, and it has sort of a uh, possibility of bifurcation. A second similar kind of observation, which could actually be the same observation, but not necessarily, is that. Uh, there is another form of history dependence in the form of uh, uh, you know, sort of composition or strain history or any of these other things. So not just that the, the rheology itself has some sort of bifurcation in it, but the, the, the actual history of the deformation or the history of the material, the entrainment, these kinds of things, has some effect and you have to track it. Okay? Uh, sorry about the spelling there. I was just trying to show that it was some archaic stuff when I was trying to show this to somebody else. Uh, so these are papers from 20 plus years ago, and really sort of set in a way some of set out some of the problems that people were having. So Adrian and Ardith have worked a lot on trying to understand how composition, how compositional variations like the continent of crust versus the mantle could be modelled self consistently, and um, and and sort of demonstrated again that this was not a trivial problem, even though it was a sort of first order one in the discipline. And so there are, and there are a bunch of you know observations. This this picture is of the sort of quite famous in Australia of the fault that lies just underneath our federal parliament, and it is of course a few millimeters in width, despite going in some you know multiple meters or kilometers uh, in in the other directions, and is typical of, of the actual amount of localization that you have to think about. Okay, uh, so we worry about such things. Okay, this is important to understand that the scales may change. We also have to worry, in a sort of multi-physics sense, we also have to worry that if we are considering something at a, a small scale, we have to essentially uh, homogenize it to the next scale. And those, that might invoke sort of a change in the actual representation from a simple sort of homogeneous physics that you see at one scale to looking particularly anisotropic, for example, at another scale. Or, um, and, and for example, you know, the different plate boundaries really have a quite different response in, in stress to strain rate if you think about how those systems self-organize. Okay? So if you can't represent them with uh, an explicit full representation of all of the pieces at every scale, then you might also have to think about making a more complicated rheological formulation that can see those things. All right. Anyway, that's an example of the kinds of rheology you might want to consider. Um, so we built Underworld to sort of to try to follow all of these kinds of things. We we used we thought that um, uh, that there should be finite elements to to uh, to allow us to <coughs> have quite some substantial robustness, um, parallel, open source, lots of good checkpointing, and um, somehow the adopted child of sitcom. We don't need to see in the movies. Um, Underworld doesn't contain any sitcom code, but it does. It has come along uh, in a sense that there was um, the original sitcom, which was written in 1994, thereabouts, uh, has sort of 
branched, and it branched into parallel versions of sitcom and sitcom S, and into uh, what I took off to make the ellipsis code, which was a particle in cell version of sitcom. There are various dotted lines on here which indicate sort of uh, no actual shared code, but similar algorithms. So ellipsis became ellipsis 3D, uh, very, very slow, was not parallel code at all. Um, the parallel version of that was sort of on the cards, and I then discovered that ellipsis wasn't actually eligible to be open sourced because I'd worked for the Australian government uh, for a few, a couple of years in there, and that uh, they wouldn't release it. So we started again, and that's how we ended up with Underworld, completely fresh code base. For anyone who's used Underworld, the old version of that's quite complicated, um, partly due to the fact that we got a lot of money at the beginning, and then suddenly we ran out of, we weren't given any more money, and we had to, uh, we had to kind of um, take a whole lot of steps back, and we couldn't kind of fix all the prototype things that were there. We tried to grab all the good bits out of sitcom and reuse those, robust solvers, you know, multi-grid, dealing reasonably well with non-linearities, trying to cope, strong variations in rheology. This is, this is the sitcom stuff, don't need to know necessarily, but the, the methods that are in Underworld, so we wanted to keep a whole bunch of the stuff. So when I went to build Ellipsis, I wanted to try to keep all of the robust solvers, all of the fast uh, you know, the structured grid, everything else. Um, so I came across the material point methods, which are basically finite element-based particle and cell type methods. Came, came directly from um, Los Alamos uh, and the uh, University of New Mexico team, um, used mostly for very, very highly inertial problems. You can try and guess what that means. Um, but uh, so they made very good for, for emergent geometry and stuff like that. And we switched around and started using this stuff for very slow flows instead of very violent fast flows. Um, but the techniques are very useful. The particle, the particle representation um, carries sort of all the nice history information, all the Lagrangian stuff. The, uh, <coughs> the grid allows you to solve very quickly. And um, and the problem with the old-fashioned particle and cell type methods was always how do you keep the two in sync? And in the 1960s, people did a lot of particle and cell methods, and it was always difficult for them to stop the particles from clumping up or settling out. There's a lot of instabilities that, that have to be damped out. But the final element version of this is a little bit more stable, and partly because there's a very obvious mapping between the positions of the particles and sort of a, a, a mechanism to integrate to make your stiffness matrix. Okay. So the idea is that for any given particle, you can actually, you know, it, it's, a, it's a material object that travels with the material, and it can follow these different paths in the stress-strain type uh, um, you know, parts of, of, of some system. So if you, have, if you have failure and you have a bifurcation, you can track which branch you are traveling on, and you can look at what your integrated history is. Okay? But you still have a mesh which allows you to solve very fast. So those are the concepts which obviously we're going to introduce you to today in the notebooks. And although we won't get to look at all of the, uh, uh, there's another diagram, how you move the things. Um, uh, details. Yeah, so although we're not going to actually look at uh, solving problems, there's a convection problem with particles in it, it's sort of a, an unnecessary overkill most of the time, but just to demonstrate that we can sort of benchmark to reproduce full fluid problems with a Lagrangian Eulerian hybrid. Um, we're not going to be dealing with, actually, I mean, as John pointed out, we probably won't even get as far as doing the Stokes equation. Just want to introduce you to, the, to how all these concepts all fall together to do these kinds of problems. This is one in which we uh, did a shear box experiment. And here, here it's much more around tracking the, uh, the failure history of individual particles in this, in this problem. And there's probably where I started from, which was the sort of collision experiment. And here the particles represent, uh, here, well, here a lot of the particles you're seeing are just surfaces for visualization purposes. But the particles themselves here carry material properties, surface information, and all sorts of things. OK? So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to talk to you a little bit about this. The, 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 some of the things that we found, we, some of the reasons we wanted to do this was that it, you know, with, with a sort of a particle representation, it's very, it's very natural to be able to just manipulate those 
the values of those points, um, the, the properties of those points, to map some thing you already have in the real world into what you're trying to look at. So here's some interfaces from uh, receiver functions for California, and we just try to map those into uh, different um, thicknesses of materials of different properties. And we also try to map the, the faults into something which had a rheological distinct behavior. All right. When we did that, then we realized that actually a lot of the work in those workflows is something that we shouldn't personally be delivering for you. It's much more straightforward if that is handled outside by, by you. So if you want to build a map of some place, you know, use your data set, use your, you know, use your workflow, and just push it into, into Underworld that way. And that's why we moved to the sort of Python front end to help you manipulate the data and so forth. And um, so, uh, so, that, so I, I would say that at the end, <coughs> we've handed off. There's a, there's a lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes in Underworld that is, you know, handling a lot of the parallelism on your behalf and all the other all the other sort of things. But um, the, the reason we're more confident now standing up introducing people to Underworld is that there's a lot less actual, you know, to, to solve real problems, you can do that in, in this sort of, you know, in, interesting notebook interface or whatever you might choose to do. Um, and some of the things that we ask you to learn, like John was mentioning, a function interface that we have, uh, are constraints that we put on you to help, essentially, to, to allow the, the parallel evaluation of a lot of the things that otherwise... Um, you know, you would have to sort of think very hard about dealing with MPI, for example, at quite a low level. So we've wrapped a whole bunch of that stuff, and now we have to show you sort of how that works. So I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm essentially finished with that introductory, introductory thing. So we're going to move, we're going to move on to actually trying to kind of show you a way in to building the underworld workflows.